Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Phil Heron, who's going to talk about um, slow scan uh, digital video. Welcome. Hello. Everyone hear me okay? Uh, so my name is Philip Heron. Um, I'm on some rare occasions known as MI0 VIM. Uh, I don't use it very often, unfortunately. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, SSTV. Uh, ooh, hello. Uh, which was a system designed to transmit some small images over low power radio links. It's been used a lot in the uh, UK recently for transmitting images from uh, high altitude balloons. Uh, a lot of you probably already know about high altitude balloons. Uh, I know there's a few folk here who do that. Uh, basically, uh, launch a small payload under balloon, gets up to about 30 kilometers, bursts, and then parachutes back down to Earth. They normally carry a camera, some sensors, and obviously some kind of tracking device. Uh, there's been an active hub community in the UK now for about 10 years. Hi, uh, sorry, I mumble a bit. Um, Possibly. Is that any better? <laughs> speak up. <laughs> no, 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 nobody needs to hear this accent. <laughs> um, anyway, back in 2010, I started seeing images like this here and uh, sort of fell in love with it. Um, I love the idea that you can see the black sky of kind of space, the curvature of the earth and the earth below. So I thought I would have a go at that. Um, at around the same time, a group of students from Queen's University in Belfast were also planning a launch. So we decided to combine our efforts and uh, put two trackers under one balloon to give us a better chance of success. Um, that was us launching the first one. Um, back in 2010. Uh, this was actually during the volcanic eruption in Iceland that caused all the air disruption back then. I'm not going to pronounce the name of that volcano. So we pretty much had the sky to ourselves that day. This is a pretty typical shot of the tracking setup we use. This is a modified version of FL Digi, a digital mode decoder used by a lot of amateur radio folk. And the top image is the uh, tracking map which we use. Uh, you will note that this one didn't land too well. <laughs> I, I was aiming for leads, but uh, shush. Um, so yeah, we can't use amateur radio from balloons in the UK, so we tend to have to use uh, low power license exempt radios, which happily exist in the middle of the 70 centimeter band, or unhappily, depending on your point of view there. Uh, but it does limit us to uh, very low power, so sending images over that is quite difficult. But this was the sort of thing that gave me the inspiration for it. Um, I saw a demo of this in the Arma Planetarium when I was a kid. Uh, they had this Apple Mac sitting in the corner doing all sorts of strange noises, and it was very slowly drawing an image of the Earth. Uh, I think it was Meteosat 7 or maybe one of the ones before that, I don't know. I can't remember that far back. Um, so whenever I was launching a balloon, I thought it'd be kind of cool to try and do this sort of thing. Uh, live images had already been done before. These are some SSTV images from a flight called Pegasus 6, launched by James Coxon back in 2008. Uh, it wasn't too bad. It was a pretty good attempt. They were very good images. Uh, some noise caused by the payload swinging as it moved the antenna in and out of range. Um, the system I was using, I couldn't use SSTV. Uh, I was using an 80 mega microcontroller, which is similar to the one in the Arduino. They have a very little amount of memory, and images are inherently quite big. They take up a lot of memory, so doing something like SSTV on that it is possible, but it's very, very difficult. And I didn't have time at that time for my first launch. But I happen to have one of these for another project. Uh, this is a small camera. It can take a picture, compress it to JPEG, and then transmit it over a serial line, which can be interfaced with a microcontroller really easily. Uh, but also has the advantage that we can read it off at a slow rate. We can take in the image at small chunks and then transmit them down in real time 
from the payload over RTTY. Uh, I did a few quick tests with this on the ground and a low resolution image took about five minutes to transmit over a 300 baud RTTY link. Uh, it's still a lot slower than SSTV but these flights normally last over an hour so you can get a fair few images from it. Uh, one of the major advantages that I thought about when developing this was because it's packetized digital format we can have all of the data received by all of the stations on the ground combined online and potentially any one station that has gaps those gaps can be filled in with data from other stations so the idea was the more receivers on the ground the more likely you were going to get a complete image uh, it was called SSDV slow scan digital video uh, it's just a play on SSTV it doesn't really mean anything it's a bit of a lie um, so on the first flight these were the results uh, I got one complete image um, as it turns out JPEG does not like uh, interruptions in its data stream um, but there, there was it was a good start and that last one sort of gave me the Im impulse to work on uh, let's see So yeah, I, th I thought initially this would be simpler than SSTV, but no, it wasn't going to be that easy. And the reason is because of the way JPEG is structured. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, you'll be th glad to hear. Uh, so that's what a, roughly what a JPEG file looks like on the left. Um, the image data in blue is the bit we want, but all of the headers before that are essentially required to required for the JPEG decoders to be able to understand what the image data means. They describe how the image data is structured. So if you lose any of that, you've lost the entire image. The image data itself is structured in a way that if you lose any data within it, it the, J, the, J, can almost speak, the JPEG decoder can, can have difficulties resuming the decoding or in the cases of my first flight, it just gives up entirely. So when I was looking at the data for that first flight, I noticed that all of the headers there were identical for every image so I thought, let's just get rid of them, we don't need them. Um, or at least you need the bare minimum amount of them. So I compacted that into a very, very small header. Uh, I put some Reed Solomon FEC. This Reed Solomon coding is an error correction system. So if there's any errors in each of the image blocks, it was able to correct a certain number of them. Uh, essentially what this was, was each packet is a small JPEG file on its own in a sense. Uh, they can each be decoded individually if you only ever get one uh, and then they can obviously be combined into a much larger image. Uh, each packet is about 256 bytes, it takes about 10 seconds to transmit over RTTY, those that we use at the moment. Uh, there's some extra information stored in the header to help the SSDV decoder fill in the gaps essentially, if there are any gaps. Uh, this uh, makes the JPEG decoder a lot happier. So rather than it becoming confused, it, you just get a, an empty space in the image. Uh, so it was time to test again. Uh, it worked, kind of. Uh, my second flight had a faulty antenna. I lost the signal quite quickly after launch. Uh, it was tracked by a few people, landed somewhere in the Yorkshire Dales. And as far as I know, it's still there, if you, if, 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 if you fancy a trip. Um, I did go and look, but there was no sign of it. Uh, I did a third flight again, and uh, these, were, these were the images were from. That worked quite well. Uh, this one landed 10 meters up a tree in a forest, surrounded by a bog, on top of a mountain. So. <laughs> Mucky feet. Uh, it took three goes to get out of the tree, but we got it eventually. Uh, but it worked well. Um, data for this one was received by about three or four stations spread out across over the UK. So the, the, the combining part was proved to work very well. Um, and I thought after that, it was time to try and do something bigger. Um, there we go. So there is a thing called uh, floating flights, floaters, uh, as they're sometimes called. Uh, where a balloon will rise up to a certain altitude and rather than bursting it will just stop and float at a steady altitude. 
Uh, a few people had done this before, but I thought we should try one with an, a camera on it and send the live images down. It would be a good test of the uh, distributed listener system that we have here. Now, all of these stations were listening to this balloon. It floated for over 24 hours and landed in Belarus. And we got images the whole way. So I don't think we lost a single packet that time. Uh, I don't think that would have been possible with SSTV. Uh, unfortunately, most of the images were at night. It was completely black. <laughs> <laughs> details, details. Uh, you know it. So what's next? JPEG is really, really old. It was finalized about 25 years ago, but it's still pretty dominant in the internet. So it's doing quite well. For any technology to be around 25 years later is quite good. Uh, there are modern image formats like Google's WebP or BPG. Uh, these potentially could be used. I know there's a few people looking at BPG at the moment. Um, whether or not they'll work, it's hard to say. Uh, I think JPEG's pretty much good enough at the moment. Uh, other work being done on trying to make them go faster because 300 baud RTTY is pretty awful. Uh, I used it simply because RTTY was, was what was being used at the time for tracking. Uh, normally it was 50 baud, but 300 baud works quite well. Uh, there was a few tests at 600 baud, and I think one, one Dutch guy did 1200 baud. It kind of worked, but not very well. Um, SSDV over APRS is also possible, but that goes to the opposite spectrum of being really slow. You don't want to be sending too many APRS packets with image data in it. Uh, but it's been done, and it worked quite well. Uh, LoRa is also a potential replacement. Uh, Dave Vickerman has been testing that recently and has has been having some pretty good success with that. The images he's sending back are, rather, rather than sending lots of small images back, he's sending very high quality images back and it's pretty fantastic. Um, and there's also been some other work on doing a faster FSK modem in Australia, but that's early days yet. And that is more or less that. Um, there was supposed to be a demo, but as usual, I left it to the last minute and it didn't work. So none of that. Hey. That was a lot quicker than the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Uh, are there any questions? Hello. Sorry. Sorry, I the microphone. can be heard in London from here. Uh, what was actually the problem when you say the aerial was swinging around? Was, which was more important, the fact that it was swinging around or the lack of gain? Uh, the antennas have gain outwards but not down, so there's sort of a cone of null below it. So you're so kind of using a collinear upside down? It's similar to that. They're, they tend to be quarter waves, or they tend to have kinks in the aerials. The, the radiation pattern is not very consistent, so because they're quite small antennas, they're made of very light material, they can twist around a bit. So as the payloads but are swinging, things are moving around and they can fade in and out. Right. But overall, was the gain okay? What I'm saying is, could you have got away with a an antenna which has actually got a better radiation pattern for doing that sort of thing. Potentially, but yes. You yes. would reduce the range, obviously, at the horizon, but locally it would probably decode fine. Okay. But ultimately it depends on the speed you're transmitting at. Exactly. When are you planning your next flight? I've been planning my next flight for about a year. <laughs> what day, what day are you going to fly next? Where? 23rd of September sounds good to me at Digicon in Northern Ireland. Uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, <laughs> there is a potential for some test flights next week from EMF camp. I don't know. It's All right. I haven't settled on that yet. Uh, do you add any FEC in the packets? Yeah, the Reed Solomon codes at the end are the FEC. Uh, they can correct for up to 32 or 16 generally errors for each packet, um, 32 under special occasions or conditions. Um, that's, that's worked pretty well. Most, most packets in the server that we receive from receivers will always have a couple of errors. So that allows it to work. If we didn't have that, it, I don't think it would work at all. <coughs> Any more questions? One more. Um, on, it, it, in some of the earlier satellites, there was a protocol a protocol called FTL zero, which so the so the ground station receiver would actually transmit up a whole request to the satellite, saying, "I'm missing this bit of the file. Please, can you retransmit it?" 
Um, one of the complaints, of course, we've got to have a receiver on the balloon. I just wonder if you consider a system like that to um, improve the efficiency of your... Yeah, uh, one of the things Dave's been doing with the LoRa mode is to have uh, uplinks to the balloons. Uh, LoRa modules tend to be transceivers. They can receive as well as transmit. And he's put in a protocol where he can query the online server to say, you know, which packets are missing. And, and then he can upload that to the payload and it'll then fill in the gaps after the fact. It works quite well, but the, the range on the uplinks are quite limited, so there's still some work to be done on that. Just time for one more question before we take. Thanks. Um, on one of the images where you're talking about the, the balloon was swinging mm -hmm. and you were getting the noise bars or the, the, the signal drops, that's the one, that's the one. Yep. Did you get a chance to measure the gap between the lines and was uh, it constant? I didn't, this, was, this wasn't my flight, but uh, it looked quite constant. Uh, generally, the swinging is to do with the length of the cord between the balloon and the payload. It's usually quite consistent. I was just wondering whether you, you could correlate that to a swing rate. Uh, yes, I would say you could. Um, I would, I would imagine too that the speed it swings at is probably dependent on the air pressure as well. So it's probably related to the altitude. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. No uh, thank you, Phil. No worries. And uh, one more round of appreciation, I think. <laughs>